Thank you guys so much. There's something about what God is doing in this year and the fullness of joy that comes from his presence. It's in this year that the fulfillment of things we've been believing for coming to pass. There's something about in the, in the fullness of joy and his presence that happens that makes all the difference in the world. And there's something anointed tonight. I've never spoke uh, on this, but God's placed in my heart strongly about work. Now, how many are ready to amen a sermon about work? <laughs> One thing about it is laziness has no place in the kingdom. Laziness is no place in the kingdom at all. And for those that are waiting for the management position and you're holding out for the um, for, for, for that type of thing, that, that's not that's not kingdom. Kingdom says, I'm going to serve right now. God, what door do you have open for me? And I want to work unto you, God. And we just believe that the Christians ought to be the ones placed on the top of the pile because they know if they're a Christian, that they're actually people that work hard, people that represent the kingdom well. Why? Because they have a work effort behind them. They're not the ones out there taking up smoking to try to get a break. They're not the ones out there trying to cheat out as much as they can, take long uh, lunches, but they actually have a, a work ethic behind them. Can I hear an amen? Work is an activity such as a job that a person uses physical, mental, or effort to do, usually for money. And uh, in John chapter 9, we find that this blind man has come across the path of Jesus' ministry, Inc. And the disciples are all standing around. The people are questioning what has happened that has caused him to experience this blindness in his life. He was blind, and they're concerned and wondering about the fact of, um, was it because of the sins of his parents? Um, they, under, they, they had an understanding about, like, this life that we live is generational. And, and yes, there's generational blessings, and there's also gener other things that are out there that they were sitting and wondering, is he experiencing this torment in his life because of the sins of his parents? And I love in John chapter 9, Jesus, he, he he's, he's kind of lets them know, you guys can sit here and try to reason it all out all you want, but none of it makes any difference. I don't care why he is the way that he is. The point is right now, things are about to change. It doesn't matter why he's in this state, and you guys think you can find the reason out, but does it really matter? Does it really matter? Have you ever started to come out trying to reason something out and come out on the other end like successful and happy and glad that you did? Not me. Usually it's the other way around. But Jesus answered in John chapter 9 and verse 3. Um, he says, neither this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work, but as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when we had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. Father, we thank you for your word here tonight. Lord, we thank you that you have an assignment for us here. And we, Lord, we want to receive each and every part of it. Lord, we want to run with your word here tonight in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Now, we have anointed services all the time. But I never thought maybe we could get some mud up here and some dirt uh, for our next anointing service. Hey, it's biblical. I don't know how many would stand in the line, but you know what? Uh, here we find that I love it. Jesus began to describe um, his, the, what his life has come out of. I must work the works of him that sent me. There is a work that must be done. And this is something that didn't just start. But out of his life, you can see in John chapter 14, he speaks about 
the vine and that we are the, that we are the branches. And he spoke of his own relationship with his father. And as long as he was in his father and his father and him were connected, that that was the life source. And the same for you and me. As long as we are connected to the vine, that we find that there's life in the vine. And he begins to describe these things, but he's, he's speaking of this relationship. And it didn't just start here because the cool thing about Jesus is when he was 12 years of age and they're looking all over for Jesus and he said wouldn't you know that I'd be about my father's business right now when it comes to the kingdom of God whether you're plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in a field and in one moment of time a mantle is cast upon you just ask Elisha what can happen in one day's time Elisha who was sitting there with the sweat running from his brow because it takes a lot to sit there with a 12 yoke of oxen and plow a field Elisha knew and when God is looking to cast a, an anointing and a mantle upon it's not the person over there that's waiting around for something to happen, waiting for the ship to come in, waiting for God to anoint them. But God looks to anoint somebody that's got his hand to the plow already. He's looking for somebody who's not standing around waiting, saying, God, I know one day you're going to do something, and you got a lot of wishbone but no backbone in you. But he's looking for somebody that's saying, I'm going to find somebody that's not sitting there parked on the side of the road, but they're doing something. And just like he found Saul of Tarsus, who was completely wrong, completely missed it, but he had a sincerity about his heart that God said, you may be imprisoning a part of stoning of Stephen, but you are going to be the one that I use and change the world upside down. He takes the one who would be the least likely, but you know what? At least he was doing something. At least Saul of Tarsus was about his father's business, even if he was completely wrong. But there's something about that even if your heart is sincere, as long as you have your hand to doing something, as long as you have your hand to doing something, it's quiet in here. I know I'm talking about work, but we all want the double portion anointing, but it happens by somebody who's willing to plow a field. You want a double portion, you've got to be able to have your hand to something and waiting. Now, we know there is a waiting in the Spirit. We know that there's those times of prayer. But my gosh, if you're praying all the time and not doing anything besides that, and we want the anointing, and we're waiting for the next slap of oil or the lightning bolt to hit us or a burning bush, and, and, and God is waiting for us to do something that He can anoint. We're waiting for the anointing. He's waiting for a believer. You know that that. That, that cry that went out with Elisha, where is the Lord God of Elijah, right? When he struck with Elijah's mantle. And God's asking, just as the cry of the heart is, where are today's Elijahs? Where is somebody that's willing to step up and stand up for me? Where is somebody that's willing to go against the grain, to even fight somebody that's so bold to go against a political system of his day? And he's saying, if I can find me somebody who's willing to stand up, then you'll find somebody who the God of Elijah, who still answers by fire. I will still find somebody who is sitting there plowing in the field, and Elijah casts his mantle upon him. Why? Because he had a destiny. And even though Elisha, I don't know what was ever in his heart, whether he ever realized or thought, because in that day there were schools of the prophets. But it was in that moment that a mantle was cast upon somebody who was plowing in a field. He was working, sweating calluses on his hands because he worked and he knew how to work. So often I think a lot of the hopelessness that invades our life is because we have a passion and we want to do something for God. We've stood at altars saying, God, I surrender all. We've sang the songs, and then we go back on Monday, and we feel like as if, God, I, I'm surrendered to you, but I don't really know what else I, I need to do. And you feel like what, what my job and what I'm being paid to do has nothing to do with my destiny. And we get these conflicting feelings of hopelessness because it has nothing to do with what we do to earn a living. Our destiny and our identity is not wrapped up in what I do for a living. People like to ask you, well, what is it that, you know, what is it that you are? Who are you? Or what do you do? And the first thing you want to do is say your job. But your job is not your identity. 
I said, your job is not your identity. And our insecurity can't come from what we are not doing when we're connected to the vine. And as long as I stay connected to the vine, whatever time I punch in on, by, uh, punch in on the time clock, Monday through Friday, does not dictate my destiny of who God has called me to be. I'm talking about work tonight. We're talking about work. You have people that are wanting so much of the supernatural to happen, and yet they're not willing to get some calluses on their hand. Paul, the apostle, even made tents when he had to. When he needed to, he made some tents. I'm talking to Paul, the apostle. Raised people from the dead. They took the, the, the cloth that he used to wipe his sweat with, and demons would flee. And yet there were still times when he needed some finances in his life. There were still some times when the, the Christians of that day weren't help supporting Paul's ministry the way that it was. And instead of sitting there and crying out to God about why the supernatural provision didn't come in, when he spoke to it and he promised it and proclaimed it, he said, you know what, if it ain't here, I'll go make some tents if I have to. If I have to take matters into my own hands, I'm going to make sure this gospel goes ahead. And I am so glad that Paul wasn't so holy that he couldn't make tents if he needed to. He still was able to work when he needed to work. And I am so glad that Pastor Hap, another tent maker who owns Tri-City Canvas, didn't wait years ago when God began to speak into, to them as, as they were still uh, loving and said, will you love my children? And will you begin? And they begin to love on children. They had a children's ministry that went around the nation and around the world. They never had to give up business cards. They didn't have websites back then. And they weren't trying to promote themselves, but they constantly got invitations for them to come minister in churches all around the nation. Why? Because they answered a call of God saying, yes, we will love, and they loved well. We're not talking felt boards. They built puppet stages and hundreds of puppets and pyrotechnicians of flames back in the day, right? They were sitting there, and they did it with an excellence that people were calling them instead of them handing out their business cards. And I'm so glad that he wasn't waiting. And not that I, I remember in the testimony whether Pastor Hap ever had a burning bush experience, whether an angel ever came to him and said, feed my lambs. No, nothing like that happened. They just said yes to God. And it wasn't always easy putting up a puppet stage, tearing it down, going from one church to the next, not always getting a lot of thanks. But with a generous heart and being able to give to a children's ministry, it turned into a church called Greater Glory as they began to take and put the puppet stage and plant it in a children's church room. And they begin to develop and build a ministry that we get to sit in today and come out on a night and experience the presence of God and worship. And although it was easy for us, besides depending on whether it was cold or not outside, but it was because Pastors Happ and Sandy were toiled and it wasn't always easy. And they were part of constructing of this church and of this ministry. And it started, and, and you know what? Here, here they've raised up a ministry and they've been around the world. And I'm so glad they didn't wait. And here he still works Monday through Friday. Pastor Hap that wasn't so holy that he still didn't go into work because he knew the tithes wasn't going to pay for what needed to be done. And he kept on making some canvases. And still to this day, you know what he's going to do tomorrow? He's going to go make some canvases. And God is able to use somebody that's not lazy and, and not waiting and saying, God, you know what? Um, because of what I do, he didn't stop being someone who made canvases, stop him from blessing children of generations all through the years. Over how many years? Over 40 years. Now that's a yes of over 40 years. Having adults coming up to you still saying, hey, I remember you. Thank you. And candy. Talking about the candy. You know, the important spiritual stuff in children's ministry. Right? And God is able to use in spite because they, in the process of the working, we find. And Jesus said, I have come to work the works 
of him who sent me. I've come to work. Working while in ministry. And not waiting for ministry. (laughs) But starting ministry while you're working. Smith Wigglesworth, one of our greatest heroes of faith, was a plumber. And, and he answered the call of God on his life, and history was written, and the rest was history. And he started in his later years of his life as a plumber. Watch Jesus not struggle with his identity because of what he was paid to do. Because Jesus shows us by example that God can use a carpenter to turn the world upside down. God can use a carpenter to turn a world upside down. It doesn't necessarily matter. We're not confined to our job to rely, to be tapped into our purpose. And joy happens when the hopelessness is gone by saying, you know what? Maybe I'm still punching. I'm going to work tomorrow. But I'm going to go with a passion and a vision and a purpose in my life that in spite of what I get paid to do, God, you have purpose for me. And although I may be doing carpentry, making tents like Paul, or doing whatever needs to be done, but I'm not saying that that's who I am. And I'm still going to minister for you, God. I'm going to be the most spirit-filled plumber that there is. I'm going to be the the greatest carpenter, doctor, lawyer, housewife, house dad. I'm going to be the greatest spiritual uh, uh, of that place of where I am. God, I'm going to be so in love with you, fall so in love with you that in spite of what I do, God, that you, as long as I stay connected to the vine, wouldn't you know I'd be about my father's business? Not just all work, because at that time, just being 12, what was his father's business? He's in at church asking questions, so hungry for God, asking questions that the wisdom confounded the rabbis of the day. He's hungry after God in such a way. One of the most incredible divine encounters that was recorded in Scripture is when a carpenter was baptized in a Jordan River, and the voice from heaven says, This is my beloved Son, who I'm what? Well pleased. Jesus hadn't healed a blind man. He hasn't even walked on water. And God, he knew the pleasures of God, even though he had not done anything for ministry. Are you listening to me tonight? The pleasures of the Father isn't what we would think. We would think, God, I need to win 10 people to Jesus this week so I can make you proud. Don't get me wrong. Angels are going to rejoice when one comes to Jesus, and there will be something in heaven called a party that they're going to be proud of. But that's not, the Father isn't sitting there upon uh, what we do for him for his pleasure. Because at this point, I don't think Jesus had, had even turned water into wine. But yet, the father was pleased and proud of them because of the relationship that they walked in together. Because of their obedience. And somehow, in the obedience, in the secret place, in the quiet years where nobody knows your name, Charisma isn't asking for an interview. TBN hasn't called your cell phone saying, would you please come in for an interview? And nobody knows who you are. And you're developing this relationship with God that he says, I am so pleased in you. Not even for what you've done. Yes, you're a hard worker, but you're so obedient. You were so obedient, and I love you. And you're, and you're repenting in a Jordan River, even as a man with no sin. Wow! And it's based upon this relationship that he turns. And he said, I am the light of the world. Then he turns to the disciples, and he says, now you are going to go and be the light of the world. And as my Father is in me and I am in Him, you are to be in me. As you are connected to the vine, you find the greatest work of all is that Jesus was in a place. He he goes on to say, I'm taking a little bit longer than I intended to. Please forgive me. (laughs) But Jesus describes how the work is done. And that he is in a place of surrender where the work of the Father is working through him. Beyond effort than what we could ever drum up on our own. is a place of surrender, of allowing God to work out the salvation with inside of ourselves. 
I, I love Psalms 37 where it speaks about when you delight yourself in him, he gives you the desires of your heart. One of the, my, my favorite passages of scripture. But later on in the next verse or two, it speaks about that he brings it to pass as a son, as a son of the noonday. And it says that God brings forth our righteousness. And as we keep worshiping him, we ain't perfect. Aren't you glad you don't have to be perfect to worship? But there's something about seeking him and worshiping him that unfolds a righteousness that we never could have done out of discipline alone. And something that we never could have made ourselves and done and watched or crossed our T's and dotted our I's. But there's something about this love interaction with the worship of the Father that he unfolds our righteousness as the noonday sun, he says. <laughs> Leonard Ravenhill speaking because of time. It speaks about there is going to be a day when you and I are standing upon the judgment seat. And we will be judged. And it tells us how we're going to be judged. It says there's going to be the things in our life that are laid before the altar. And the things that we have done that have no eternal difference. And the fire of the altar, when the fire of God hits it, it burns to ashes, wood, hay, and stubble. Are you following me? Leonard Ravenhill, a wonderful revivalist, that declared, God, don't let me be consumed and standing in heaps of ashes in that day. For in that day, I want to be able to offer you something. I want to be able to offer you the life that I lived, the works that I did and accomplished, that they mean something for eternity. That there's something about it that goes beyond the American dream. That I live for something greater than myself. And God, I was able to take a side and say, God, I will walk and work and work with you, O oh Lord. I want you to work through my life. And on that day when the fire of God hits it, I don't want it to. Now, I know there's going to be ashes around at my feet, but let it be more than ashes, God. Let it be as gold refined in the fire. Let there be jewels to add to your crown. Let there be something that was done that I could be able to say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Paul speaks about it. There will be a day. I'm believing that each and every one of us will be able to stand. Yes, with our shoulders back and our head, our head hanging high. But only because he is the glory and lifter of our head. We come in bowing low by saying, Lord, that I have something to bring and lay at your feet in my life. This thing called work, it's not all about effort, sweat, but there is blood, sweat, and tears, but it's not all about that. And there is a way the Father works out and works through us as we stay connected in his presence, fullness of joy, even if I'm punching a time clock throughout the week. Even if I have to sweat, and I'm not standing behind a pulpit, and what little people realize, because everybody thinks when I'm in the ministry that this is it, as if this is what we do all week long, Pastor Dave. <laughs> we just get, you just get to play the guitar and worship or minister sermons all throughout the week. No, just on Sunday. <laughs> but there's some the sweat that happens throughout the week. Pastors happen, Sandy, you guys, uh, in the process of working, loving children, loving adults, building, constructing ministries, both here, helping out other churches. I'll never forget, in our younger years, our biggest offering that ever came in, and we bought a steeple, only for Glen Carbon to tell us it was against code and we couldn't use it. You got to love it. And so what did they do? They gave it away to a Baptist church of all people. Baptist. Spirit filled, charismatic, tongue talking, devil casting out, crazy folk like us, blessing Baptists. It's kind of beautiful, isn't it? Helping building other churches and 
parts that on the other side of the tracks, places uh, of being apart. Going on missions trips to Guatemala. You were there with Benny Hinn and this beautiful place. And today, tonight, we get to help as, as Greg and Renee are getting ready for a missions trip. And we, they're getting ready to go forth. And we have the honor of praying for the blessings of heaven upon this missions trip. Missionary Donna has gone to Honduras. And we prayed in one of the poorest places in the third world country. And within, was it one hour? A hundred percent of the people we prayed for were healed in that one hour. People lined up coming and saying, after they've been healed, they went and got other family members and friends. Wait, they need it. They need prayer. And for one hour, we batted a thousand. And you stood back and watched God do what only God could do. We don't even speak their language. <laughs> Aren't you glad God knows their language? Everybody's standing. As pastors happen, Sandy and Donna come up. We're, we're just going to have, I know they've got some friends as well. We just want to pray over them. We want to send them off here tonight for a place of the work of the ministry that goes forth into another country that we get to see some incredible testimonies of the love of God on display. And as, as they come and, and uh, as pastors and the ministry team makes their way, I just want you guys to stretch your hands towards them here tonight. Let's stretch our hands out. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for Greg, Renee. We thank you for the Spirit of God that dwells in them so strongly. We thank you, Lord, that this is a mission sent and ordained by you, and we know the blessings of God are upon it. We thank you for divine safety, for taking care of them wherever they go, whether they fly, they drive, wherever they are, that no evil shall befall them, nor any plague shall come nigh their dwelling. We thank you, Lord for your divine care, and we bless their work in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. For I hear the Spirit of the Lord say unto you this night, it's not your mission, but it's my mission. It's not your heart, but it's my heart in your heart. And I've placed much in you. And oh, you'll see goodness, and you'll see mercy, and you'll see sadness. But I know that what you see, you will pray. And you'll become what I have called you to be there. And I am putting several little ones in your heart, especially a little girl I'm putting in your heart. And you will see her, and your heart will be meshed to her heart. And there will be a lifting up of her spirit as you touch her and minister to her. Oh, she'll not be the only one, but there'll be many others that will come, and they'll say, oh, touch us, touch us. What do you have for us? And you have your love to give. So know that this is God's mission not yours, but it's God's, and it's an assignment by the very power of the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to sit at your feet Drink from the cup in your hand, lay back against you and drink, feel your heart beat. This love is so deep, it's more than I can say. As we come to a close, everybody just coming up tonight to the altar. If you just make your way up here. God, I just thank you that tonight of the stirring, Lord, I thank you for a fresh identity, Lord, of a connection with you, Lord, that we walk and live out of this relationship with you that breathes purpose, that breathes, God, destiny, that breathes the memories of our future. God, I just thank you. I just thank you, Lord, 
for the fresh breath, Lord. I thank you for this being a week of joy. I thank you for a week of your presence, Lord, based out of our relationship with you. Lord, even in this place of work, that we're going to begin seeing a new smile on the inside of our lives. Our hearts with the place of a new smile. God, because of your presence, as we begin to shift our focus and our attention into a place, Lord, to a place that you, that means much more, Lord, that in the process of a job, God, that you are bringing forth purpose. Lord, that we are able to do a work of the work that you sent us. God, I thank you for the transformation of joy, Lord, even in our workplace, even in our day-to-day. Lord, I just thank you for that day-to-day relationship with you, birthing fresh purpose, joy in Jesus' name. Come on, just place your hands in the receiving section here tonight. Lord, we thank you for the receiving of joy, oh God. I thank you for joy, fresh joy, fresh purpose, oh God, fresh purpose and joy in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. I want 